So without further ado, then, I will um, introduce uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen is, uh, as I said, Chief Executive of OVO Energy. Um, certainly came into my consciousness after the famous uh, Select Committee appearance alongside some uh, representatives of the more incumbent big six energy companies uh, back in, I think it was October last year, in the wake of Ed Miliband's price freeze announcement. And I think as a result of that uh, appearance, the uh, customer numbers of OVO Energy started really taking off very, very rapidly. So it's a company that's grown very, very quickly, particularly in the last year, but actually was founded, I discovered, five years ago. Um, so Stephen has a background before that in the city and also a founder, of, think of a, of a media company before that. So certainly has been involved in business in various ways before founding this particular company. Um, over a very interesting new entrant into the market, but I, I won't steal any thunder by telling you any more about them. I think I'll leave that to Stephen to speak about. So Stephen, I've been delighted to invite you to speak. Um, Stephen's going to speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Hello. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say thanks for the invite. Um, I haven't been invited to give very many lectures. I, uh, I attended a few uh, while I was at Edinburgh University, um, but this is the first one I've been asked to give. So I, uh, Imperial College is an esteemed institution, and it's a real pleasure to be here and, and give you guys all uh, a few thoughts uh, from our experience in the energy market. After a few recent uh, car crashes without notes, I, I have my notes handy just in case I need to refer to them. But the messages that, that we have are really pretty simple. Um, we started OVO Energy in 2009. Uh, it was after I spent five years in the city. I, I was trading credit default swaps and corporate bonds in the heyday of the credit boom. And uh, it was a very different uh, industry to be in, a very different time. Uh, one of the sectors that I traded was the utility sector. So I knew the business models of a lot of the large European energy companies pretty well. Um, and I knew some of the challenges that they faced and the structure of the industry faced. But really, my interest in energy went a long way back. I, I loved the energy sector you know, as I first started to think about it, the size of it. I mean, when I started looking at this, uh, leaving university, thinking about what business I might like to be in, or what business, I, I wanted to start my own business. So I was thinking, what industry should I go into? I started looking at energy. It was 30 mil billion pounds a year, uh, even in 2002, 2003. It had just recently been deregulated. So there were uh, 14 regional electricity companies and then British Gas. Uh, and the, it had been deregulated, but there were no real new entrants. And also, it was pretty obvious that there was this big technology challenge that, um, that renewable energy was, even, even 10 years ago, it was, it was really starting to take off. You could see the emergence of new economies like India and China. Uh, and I mean, the first thing you learn about energy is it's nearly 100% correlated to GDP. So as GDPs grow, structurally, so does energy demand. And so with the rapid rise of emerging economies, it was pretty obvious that if we are all bidding for the same natural resource, the same fossil fuels, then it's likely that energy prices will rise at the same time that we're paying more attention to the environmental impacts. And so there's this big technological challenge or uh, innovation challenge in energy. So massive marketplace, horrible incumbents that nobody liked, a commodity, I mean, a real commodity product, and then this big shift in landscape. Now, what I actually did when I left university, um, it was very kindly referred to as a media company. I started a, a, a website advertising properties for rent, primarily for students in Scotland. And it was actually reasonably successful until I decided that it'd be a better idea to run a newspaper alongside the website. And I spent the next 18 months delivering newspapers instead of being a dot-com millionaire. Um, and I missed the dot-com boom by a, a good two or three years. And so the timing was always wrong. And I thought, if I do something next, I want to make sure I pick an industry that I think is going to be structurally uh, going in the right direction, let's say. So when I looked at, en uh, I looked at energy, I looked at telecoms, I looked at insurance, I looked at all, all these industries. And the one that stood out as the best opportunity was energy. But I didn't have any money because I blew it all in the newspaper gig. And so I went to work in the city. And I thought, OK, I need to stick at this for five years so I can A, earn some money to put into the next business venture. Uh, I'll probably want to buy a house sooner or later, and so I'll need some, some money for that. And also, I need to prove to myself I can stick at something for five years, because that's business is hard, and, and, and often, if you're going to get thrown by the first road bumps that come up in the first couple of years, then you know, you're not going to be in business long enough to get to the, the, the good stuff. 
So anyway, five years later, I still had this idea of, of, of running this energy company, and I, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to be in energy retail. And when I looked at the energy spectrum, the, 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 the whole industry, there was uh, generation, uh, there was energy efficiency, there was you know, marketing, or reselling, there was uh, the uh, renewable sector, which was starting to emerge quite strongly then, uh, infra, uh, as I said, infrastructure, the pipes and the wires and so on, or trading. And the only one that made sense, the only one that I had any experience in at all was in retail as a customer. And I'm not going to go through all the boring stories about how I decided that I could do this better, but um, it was pretty obvious to me that there was a real need for uh, what we call today disruption in the market or some fresh thinking. So I ended up writing a business plan while still trading at JP Morgan, I went to see Alexon, who managed all that balancing and settlement um, uh, infrastructure, all the trading behind the electricity system. I went to see Exosurf, who did the same for gas. I went to see Ofgem to talk about licensing. I find our billing system um, while still at JP Morgan by Googling energy billing systems and finding a company in New Zealand that had a product that we could use here in the UK. So I put together this business plan while still trading at JP Morgan and then, and then left JP Morgan and started about setting up OVO. The whole experience was as a customer. So only thinking about what I wanted. We ended up going to New Zealand to get the billing system because we couldn't find a UK billing system that would allow us to bill gas and electricity on the same account, which is bonkers. You think about, you, you, you do business with one company, you're buying gas and electricity, but it's on two different systems, two different teams, uh, and, and a terrible experience. So what I find, actually, what I set out to do was try to build a customer-centric energy company. Uh, I thought it would be about customer service, about brand, about uh, better marketing. But in fact, to deliver what customers wanted, we needed to re-engineer the operations, the systems, the technology. And so what I ended up doing, we started off, we had almost no money because I spent all the money getting my own license. I mean, thought I was going to rebrand somebody else's technology and energy trading capability. It turns out that that's the systems where all the problems lay. That's the reason for all the customer dissatisfaction and the high cost. So I spent the launch budget going through an accreditation process with Ofgem and getting our own license. So there were five of us in the end. We launched in a barn at the Royal Agricultural College in Sirencester. And between the five of us, we had four years of energy industry experience. The first person I hired, um, the guy called Tommy, he's a 23-year-old graduate. He hates when I say this, but his previous role was as a roadie in, a, in a, a music business, he was, anyway, he was uh, carrying all the equipment around. But he had a master's in engineering. Ah, oh, the mic's not on, great. Is that, uh, it's about the same, isn't it? No? Okay, great. Um, so anyway, he's a smart guy, and between the two of us, we, we downloaded all the material from Alexon, and we started working out uh, how we could buy and sell the electricity, and how we demand, run the demand forecasting, and so on. Um, the point of all of this is that we didn't start out with an energy background. We started out thinking like customers. And we, we engineered the whole business around what we thought was best for customers. So that's why what I'm talking about tonight is looking at the other end of the wire. Most of the time when I listen to people from the energy sector, they come at it from the point of view of whatever technology they're representing, whatever policy interest they're representing, or an economic interest, for example, from the government or the treasury. Very few people, when they talk about energy, talk about the customer. And no matter what policy, what technology, what generation stack you're talking about, the customer is the one that ends up paying. And we're going to talk about policy in, in a, a, well, hopefully we get around to it um, in just a little bit. But the, um, the number one thing is that with policy right now, we see this huge policy instability in the UK. And the number one reason for that is that the prices that are being paid, the subsidies that are being paid, are not sustainable for consumers to pay. It's now becoming unaffordable, and you can see that in Germany. But anyway, the other end of the wire. We, start, we look at energy about what the customer needs. So when the customer thinks about energy, they don't think about uh, wind uh, power. They don't think about fracking. They don't think about uh, combined cycle, gas turbines. They just think about the lights coming on, the television working, the fridge working, and the house being warm and the water being warm. That's what they're most interested in, heat, light, power. It's n they're not interested in that much in, in, in where it comes from. More and more, I would say, they're in interested in the environmental impact, but they are technology agnostic. They want to make sure the lights come on. That's about it. So when we think about energy uh, for customers, we start thinking about what the customer really needs. And when we set out, we thought, 
the lowest price possible, the best service possible, and the best balance between price and renewables, so affordable renewable. And on top of that, it's really, really simple. That's the only thing customers are really interested in. So we set about building that. And we've tried to position ourselves in the same place for the last five years. It's been quite difficult to execute consistently over time. We, we've grown quite a lot. This year, we've grown from 140,000 customers to about 400,000 customers. We're still under 2%. We're about 2% uh, market share in the UK. But to give you an idea, for a five-year-old company, that change, that's moving from 175 million in sales, which is already a big number, to 500 million, half a billion pound in sales this year. We've employed 400 new people this year to join the team. So we've got significant business challenges, but we've been able to keep delivering great customer service because the whole system is built on what's best for customers. So we, we manage our own technology. We hire software developers. We've got about 50 or 60 of our own software developers because it's a very technology-centric business. We invest a lot of time in training and recruitment, so we recruit the best people that we can, not from an energy background. We, we hire very few people from an energy sector background, but we train them in the things that are important to customers, and then we give them great tools to use. So, we don't think like an energy company, like a utility. I would say we think like a retailer. We don't own any power stations. We don't own any gas plants. We don't own any gas fields. We don't. You know, that we buy in the wholesale market. So we're a retailer like a lot of other retailers. We're only focused on the customer. That means we buy at the best price, we deliver the best service we can, and, and, and manage the customer relationship. So we think like a retailer first, a technology company second, and then an energy company third. And this is why it's important. There are three trends that I want to talk about very briefly, and hopefully we'll get time for some questions afterwards. But there are three trends that I think make this ever more important. Thinking about it from the, the wrong end of the wire, the, where the energy comes from, instead of who's using it, who's paying for it. I, I, if you don't think about these three trends, you'll miss out on, on some key insights. So first of all, distributed generation. It's happening in the UK through wind, and, uh, and distributed solar, for example. Uh, it's happening much more in markets like the US and Australia, partic particularly on solar. The prices for solar panels now are, are falling, uh, and falling predictably to a point where uh, they, they do have grid parity, or they're the equivalent of grid-connected electricity in a lot of parts of the states. Um, and it's getting cheaper. But distributed generation is a big, big shift because it used to be the case that energy, the, the, the way we generated electricity in particular, was um, you build a big power station, about a billion dollars, billion, pi billion pounds. Big power station, you build a power network to get the electricity to the customers, another billion pounds, and that's it. You just pump out electricity, it flows only one way down the wires to the customer, and then the money flows back. And that's it. It's quite a simple system. With distributed generation, where you don't have these high entry costs, when you think of a billion pounds to build a power station, you can now get solar panels on your roof with no upfront cost. You can get somebody to fund that, uh, and, and you can share the revenues that come from it. It's certainly happening much, much more in California, where a company called Solar City is, is causing the incumbent electricity company there huge headaches because they're so successful. So there is no upfront capital cost now to be a generator of electricity. It's a huge shift in the business model and the thinking. So energy companies that used to rely on very big, complex engineering projects with high capex uh, uh, and, and very high regulatory barriers to entry didn't have to worry about competition from other and There was no other source of electricity. But today, distributed generation means that uh, customers are as likely or soon will be as likely to be producers it's a neat phrase called prosumers. A lot of people are using now, so prosumers. And the data complexity of a system where a customer can, in one hour, be generating electricity, a net generator, and the next hour, a net consumer, working on that there's a different price for electricity every 30 minutes of every day. So working on how much electricity is being generated by whom and when, and how much we're billing them, and then how much we're overlaying a network access cost, a capacity cost versus utilization fee, these are really complex issues, policies, and economics to work out. And the, the kind of system complexity that you need to balance this uh, and, and, and be able to build those customers and, and, and repatriate money to those customers is very, very different to the systems that we used to need. So the technology landscape is shifting because of distributed generation. 
The next one is convergence, technological convergence. So again, it used to be the case that energy companies didn't have any competition. Maybe there were, you know, used to be no competition at all. Now we have competition from other energy companies. And in the future, you've got competition from other technology providers. So the, the, the best known case is probably Nest. I'm sure you've all heard of. Smart thermostat company. It's pretty smart. It's not, not rocket science, but they have got a business model now where they are selling thermostats to utilities, let's say in America. The uh, power companies are paying for these thermostats to go into customers' homes. Nest is the dominant relationship there. They, they are the, the relationship that you control the thermostat from your Nest interface on your iPad or your phone. And Nest is now making more money selling demand response back to those utilities than they are selling thermostats. So let me just explain what that means. At peak time, peak generation periods, and especially in the US, places like Texas, California, uh, the biggest demand is coming from air conditioning. And when it's hot, everybody's got the air conditioning turned up maximum. The price of energy can be 50, 100 times the average price at peak times. And so there's a huge economic incentive for energy companies to reduce the demand so they don't have to pay that abnormally high price. And so Nest have got this really clever feature where they will message their customers, and they've got the consumer engagement tools. They're messaging their customers and saying, uh, would you mind turning the, the, the air conditioning down just a little bit? And the aggregative effect of all of this is such that they are able to, anybody heard of a negawatt? Okay, negative consumption, right. So it's a way of measuring negative consumption. They're getting paid by the utility to turn these thermostats down, even though utility is funding the thermostats. So this is where you know, energy companies uh, that just sell gas and electricity, just sell kilowatt hours, find themselves now competing for customer attention with companies that are just way outside their industry. There's no way you can regulate for thermostats. There's no way that in the UK, Ofgem are going to be able to uh, start intervening in this market to, uh, to create customer outcomes. This is just this free market stuff. Same with electric vehicles. And when you look at electrification of transport, what's going to happen when a, a million, let's say when we have a million electric vehicles in the UK, at the moment, Nissan Leaf, which is a pretty middle of the road, entry level electric vehicle, 24 kilowatt hour battery, parked in your driveway, a million cars with a 24 kilowatt hour battery, that's 24 gigawatts of potential power, backup power, storage. All being charged at night, being plugged in when you drive home, do your shopping, come home, plug the car in. You're not running peak demand off the grid, you're running off local storage. That's one million cars, but I think about 30 million cars in the UK. So that's 3%. So these kinds of technological convergence will change the business models for energy companies. And they'll make consumers electricity producers, they'll make consumers electricity generators. And it's gonna have a big impact on the revenue streams for existing uh, utilities. In particular, what's, what's really interesting, the grid companies, the national grid or the distribution network operators, huge row about this in the States because the more and more people that go off grid for the majority of their consumption, if they're paying only per kilowatt hour that they use, then they're paying a fraction of the, 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 the cost that they would have done to access the grid. And so the costs are being borne by the people that don't have solar generation, which means that the grid costs are going up, on grid electricity is becoming more expensive at the same time that off grid electricity is becoming more e less expensive. And it's getting worse and worse. So there's a big impact here on the financial, the business models for what we're seeing as heavily protected regulated industries, the, the, the pipes and wires. But you can't regulate for people generating their own electricity if it's cheaper than, than buying it from the grid. So there's a lot of problems to be solved here. The last one I want to talk about is that energy company is a platform. And it's something that we launched just a little while ago uh, back in April with the Secretary of State, Ed Davey, and we call it OVO Communities. And we've taken inspiration from other retailers, in particular, uh, Amazon. So Amazon is one of the, the world's most successful online retailers of products, primarily products. And in 2001 or 2002, they took a decision that instead of competing with every other e-commerce business, they were going to open up Amazon.com as a marketplace. Anybody that wanted to sell their products on Amazon.com, they would enable that. When we looked at the energy market, we realized we were going to be able to access 
a large group of customers. You know, there are 26 and a half million energy customers in the UK, 26 and a half million households. But about 40% of those customers never switch. They have never switched. And we don't think they're going to switch to us. We don't think they're likely to switch to any energy company. And we started to think, unfortunately, these are mostly the customers are paying the highest prices, the inactivity. Uh, they, they would be defined as price inelastic. So you charge them what they like, what, what you like, they, they, they don't switch. And so we started to think about who we could team up with to partner, uh, who we could partner with to reach some of these customers. And so the trusted partner that we, we, we arrived at, the, the, the people that are best placed to address this need are local councils, local housing associations, and local energy groups. And so we created OVO Communities as, a, as essentially an energy platform where local councils can, uh, using our technology, which we share with them, they can set up their own energy retail business. We'll manage all the trading and demand forecasting. We'll manage all the operations and industry interactions. We'll do all the metering, meter installation, smart metering, everything else. And they can sell customers uh, energy at the same time as billing them for council tax. At the same time as collecting the rent from, uh, from social tenants, they can bundle that with gas and electricity. This is a big technological shift for us. But what we see is that uh, we don't want to compete with everybody. We want to run our energy company. We've got our own customers, but we also want to leverage the platform that we've built. So by opening up, by sharing that infrastructure, we can reach a much larger market. And this is something that's happening across the world. In Germany, 52% of all electricity is sold through Stadtwerke, which is their local municipalities. So it's, a, it's a huge thing. I think 70% of gas and 52% of energy, uh, electricity. And so this is something that we see, and increasingly as uh, something we didn't talk about um, as much, and we don't talk about as much as heat, but we see a big interest in distributed and uh, district heat networks that tend to be run by local authorities. And so when you can exchange gas for heat and, 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 and use heat as a reservoir for intermittent generation and storage, all of these systems become interconnected at a city-wide level or community-wide level. And so us providing a platform where instead of it being uh, you know, a dozen new entrants competing with the big six, we're targeting to have 100 partners selling to their local community residents. So th that's a big trend that's happening in other markets. We don't see it so much in energy just yet, but it, it's, it's that idea of people getting together in, in, in collective purchasing. Um, Jack Ma from Alibaba um, coined a phrase, or at least I heard him say it, um, that in the future, business isn't going to be either B to B, business to business, or B to C, uh, business to consumer. They're building for C to B. So consumers telling business what they want, and business is delivering it, which I thought was a great explanation of the power that technology has now in enabling consumers. So energy as a platform is going to change the way we think about energy companies, away from being uh, all of those trends, right? distributed generation, energy as a platform, and that technology convergence is going to change the way energy company business models work. There's not going to be very much money in just selling kilowatt hours. We have to partner with customers, help them get the best out of their energy. So looking at policy from the other end of the wire, I'm not going to talk too long about this. Um, but when you think about what we see in policy at the moment between RMR, so the retail market reform, we say, OK, we're going to change the energy market by restricting every company to have four tariffs. What about economy seven? Okay, you can have four tariffs for standard and four tariffs for economy seven. Okay, what about direct debit? Yeah, you can have a difference in price for different payment methods. And you can have uh, a difference in price if there's a warm home discount or not a warm home discount. And before you know it, even within these four tariffs, which is supposed to be the big revolution in the energy market, it turns out there are like 64 different combinations of these four different tariffs. So this is just not good regulation, okay? It's well-intentioned, but unfortunately, this is an example where you cannot always regulate for the outcome that you want. So I think if you're starting with a customer in mind, you start off saying, okay, mostly what customers want is for the lights to stay on, so let's make sure we regulate for that. Uh, I'll come on to EMR in just a second. Uh, but let's make sure the lights are on. So let's create an environment where people can invest in generation without a retail business. We've got a lot of independent generators in the UK with no retail operation. Um, let's regulate for fairness. Let's regulate on the principle of fairness. Let's just say to energy companies, here are a bunch of regulations that will encourage you, or require you, to treat customers fairly. One of the things we're asking for is called cost reflexivity. And that means that you shouldn't be able to charge 
a hugely different price between house A and house B right next to each other. They both use the same amount of energy. But in today's market, it's perfectly okay to charge one house 25% more than the other, simply because they're priced in elastic. So we think that all energy tariffs should be cost reflexive. You should have to explain the difference. That if it's really cheaper to sell energy to this customer, that's fine. But you have to explain the difference. So we should be regulating for fairness. EMR is an interesting one, the energy market reforms. This is where basically government policy is now dictating every generation investment choice in the UK. So the government set a subsidy regime, and that's the only thing that will dictate what generation we get built here. And consumers don't care about the offshore wind industry's needs for more subsidies. The, consumer the consumers don't care about you know, whether or not there's going to be a closure in a, in, a, uh, in a wind farm plant unless we have more subsidies. The consumers don't care if we subsidize solar more. They, they just want the lights to come on and they, they want the, the energy bills to be as low as possible uh, and, and balance the environmental impact. And so if you were thinking with a customer in mind, the customer who's paying for all of this, you would say, if carbon is the enemy, if carbon is the thing that we're trying to avoid, let's just have a price for carbon. And let's let the market decide how best to deliver economically carbon reduction. So if you can arrive at a fair price for carbon and do away with all other subsidies, then you are, like the customer, technology agnostic. So you wouldn't, if you were thinking from the right end of the wire, you wouldn't be sitting in Whitehall making decisions about how much you're going to pay generators for the next 20 years for technology that you know should on its stand on its own two feet. And the last thing we should have as much competition as possible. You know, consumers want choice. Um, and when I hear that the energy market is too confusing, I think you know a lot of companies have made it very confusing, but it doesn't need to be. There are way more mobile phone tariffs on the market than there are energy tariffs. But everybody loves their new iPhone, so nobody minds so much. But I think we need more choice. But I think we, instead of just having six big energy companies that have got 92% market share, we should have more variety. I'm definitely over time now. So I'm just going to say one more thing uh, and then wrap up. Um, trust is the thing that makes all of this work. I think in an industry where you build big power stations, big power networks, and you pump gas and electricity to customers, then they just pay the bill or they get cut off. But in a world where energy efficiency is important, in a world where demand-side response is important, in a world where we have intermittent generation, in a world where you need customers on your side to make the policies work, to make them economic, then you need to be an, a, a partner with those customers. It's not enough just to, uh, to tell them, look, you don't have a choice, you're going to need to buy gas and electricity. You know, we need customer engagement uh, first and foremost, we need investment energy efficiency more than anything else in this country uh, as it relates to energy. And so the best place industry, the best place companies to talk to consumers about energy are energy companies. And consumers don't want to hear. They're not listening. Because as an industry, we've lost the trust of consumers. So winning that trust back makes a huge difference. If you look at the economics behind energy efficiency, a big part of the reason why very simple stuff like loft insulation isn't working is that the transaction cost, the cost of reaching the customer is so high. It's a perfectly logical investment. You invest three or four hundred pounds a day, you save that over two or, three two or three years. That's a massive payback. But it's hard to get customers to listen because we're, we're all busy tuned out of energy because we assume we're being lied to. So we've ended up as an industry in a situation where the, 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 the poor relationship that we've had with customers over time has meant that it is now almost impossible to win that trust back. Ovo, uh, at Ovo, I think we're doing our part, um, but we need to see you know, other energy companies, not just with better rhetoric, better marketing, better branding, and better CG. Anybody seen the SSE ads on TV, the orangutan? It's a beautiful CGI, uh, but there's such a long way further to go in rebuilding customer trust, and, and hopefully that's what we're doing. So anyway, that's a few thoughts about energy from the customer's end of the wire. Uh, and now we have some time for questions. So I guess I will stay up here. And you're going to moderate for questions. Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Which one? Provoking, uh, wide ranging, and really good explanation of, sort of what's on your mind in this customer end of the wire. 
idea that has driven your business. So um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Um, and I've got some up my sleeve just in case there aren't. But uh, we've got one already at the front. I think what I'll do in the usual fashion is take uh, maybe two or three and then come back to you and, and go for a further round. So we'll come to the front here first and there second. There's a microphone just there. <laughs> so please. And if you could briefly introduce yourself before you answer. Ask yes. your question. Uh, Martin Chu, just a bit tired, pretty comms guy actually. Um, yeah, very interested. Recently changed to your company. Very pleased. Thank you very, much. very upset with Scottish Power, who wouldn't close our account after God knows how many months. I won't go into their computer systems. Oh, uh, nice <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just fascinated about the, the wholesale market. Um, you seem to be, with your business model, quite dependent on the wholesale market. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that, because with vertical integration with some companies, they seem to be in a position to stitch you up quite badly. Oh, I'm just interested in that. Okay. Thank you. Hold that thought. Uh, second question over here. Uh, hi, I'm Sam um, from the Energy Institute. I just uh, wondered, could you say a bit more about how your business relates to infrastructure? Um, and, and do you pay the same costs as power generation companies? Or are you able to um, not have to pay all the costs that they pay? Is that, is that where you can make your difference in your margin? Third question just here. Hi, yeah, I'm Michael Kenfick, I'm doing part of the master's course here. I was wondering what's the biggest challenge with the distribu distributed generation? Is it technical, social, political? So what, are your, what, are your, what do you see as the problems? Okay, so uh, three wholesale questions. Wholesale, infrastructure, so, and yeah, that's right. So, wholesale markets, it's very simple. I mean, the gas market and electricity market are actually quite different. Um, so the gas market is very liquid. It's an international market. If we wanted to, we could buy gas from Qatar, from Trinidad, from not quite to North America yet. Uh, we could buy gas from anywhere in the world and have it delivered. We can uh, buy capacity at uh, Milford Haven or another LNG plant and, and pump it into the system. So very, very liquid, very straightforward. Um, and it was up until a few months ago the most liquid market in Europe, the, the European benchmark. So the NBP, National Balancing Point, is a, a international uh, benchmark for gas prices. You can buy gas on that market the same way as you could buy a bag of coal, uh, a, a barrel of oil, or uh, a, 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 a truckle of logs, if you like. So the electricity market is slightly more different. It's much less liquid, um, and that is a, as a factor of vertical integration. But it's also because um, there has, up until recently, not been a very big retail demand. So the big six have got their own retail and, and, and generation capability, but um, there wasn't a lot of retail demand from companies outside the big six. They used to trade with each other on an OTC basis, over the counter basis, and it wasn't very liquid, it wasn't very transparent. It is changing, and there's been some government requirements to uh, force vertically integrated companies, actually all large generators, once a day to open pricing on liquid blocks, and it's, it's working quite well. But about 35 percent of all generation in the UK is owned by uh, somebody other than the big six. So it's quite fragmented. I think there are more, I don't know, but there are definitely more independent generators than there are independent suppliers. And I don't think any one energy company has got the market size to, to dominate or distort that market. Um, and it's under a lot of scrutiny. And it's never been something we've really thought about. I, I've always been quite content that it's not perfect, but it's by far and away not the biggest problem we have. So it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's complicated, but it, it, it works. On to infrastructure. The infrastructure, the transmission and distribution is completely regulated. Everybody pays the same price. You go to Ofgem's website, you can download, uh, actually it's all the distribution companies, transmission companies. They regulate every year, they publish their prices. And that's it, per kilowatt hour, pence per day. So there is no difference between us and British Gas or even uh, Scottish Power and Scottish Southern SSD. They're the only two, in fact, that still own their power networks. The others got sold off, um, typically to infrastructure funds or other financial investors. Uh, but for Scottish Power and SSD, even for them, their retail businesses operate at arm's length through their regulated businesses. So I would say we focus on the retail component of the market. So. From a wholesale point of view, we aim to be no worse off. So we have to get our demand forecasting right and be good at executing on trading and at, 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 at
be efficient in, in trading. And from an uh, infrastructure point of view, it, we, we are by by virtue of the fact that everybody pays the same, it's a level playing field. So where we aim to have our advantage is in the retail, uh, retail segment of the value chain. <coughs> Distributed generation. Um, the big challenge has been a combination of um, choice of technology, I would say, uh, the, the cost of the technology. There's a big, big difference in convincing customers to have solar panels on the rooftops if it costs 10% more than buying off the grid, than when it costs 10% less. Okay. The number of people you can get to invest in solar panels when it's cheaper than mains electricity is a dramatic multiple of the number of people that want to pay extra. It becomes the logical choice instead of the optional choice. And so the cost of the technology is a, is a big factor. Um, in the UK, we've typically subsidized renewable generation. I initially, for solar, a horrendous amount. It was an 800% subsidy for solar generation at the wholesale level. At a distributed level, it's more like 500 to 450%. And that lasted for about two years, and it's costing hundreds of millions of pounds now for very little electricity, and that's inflation linked for 20 years, maybe 25. 25. Very expensive for what you get. In Germany, a much bigger problem. So German renewable subsidies now account for 24 billion pounds on top of what the energy bills would be otherwise. 24 billion euros, sorry. Which is 300, it's about that, it's about that number, 300 euros per living person in Germany every year for the next 20 years. So when you think about the challenges with distributed generation, getting the right balance between uh, you know, the economics, that's the number one thing. But it comes back to having a price for carbon. If we had a real price for carbon, instead of uh, assuming that coal-fired and gas-fired power stations can pump carbon into the atmosphere with no penalty, then the economics would be different. Um, so we need efficiency in the technology. We need better systems to enable more innovative business models, so the likes of Silver City, Next and so on, they enable uh, distributed generation also with energy efficiency. Um, so we need more technology, we need lower prices that can be done. And then energy storage is the last one. So the price of energy storage also falling and pretty predictably uh, to the extent that um, distributed solar plus storage will be cost competitive very soon in this day. next five, six years, that, that expectation. And so once you've got that, then you know, you've got intermittent generation, but it doesn't matter because you've got backup storage. Thank you. Um, so I'll have a few more hands. I've got a hand here. I'll go over to the back there and then just here and I'll bring you in the next round. So please. Yes, I am from OECD. The question is, uh, I think your approach is a more community that's oriented approach. So this means you have at the center the community, not just an individual person or a group. So because I'm dealing with, uh, let's say, smart, smart strategy specialization for the cities, my question is, uh, are you using some kind of, uh, suppose, yes, platform where you link in an intelligent way, a distributed in an intelligent way, the, the energy to the community? So can you spend some word about this type of platform? Okay. Um, the second one, just in the middle here. Hi, Stephen. I'm Will. I'm stopping your master's here at uh, uh, Imperial. Um, Where are you? Oh, there you are. Hi, yes. I didn't go in the last one. Um, so you talked about um, improving energy efficiency. Um, I'm quite interested in that area and also the consumption patterns um, of consumers and, and, all, and also businesses. Um, do you think there's a strategy for um, improving that so um, people are more efficient using energy and also at the same time reducing the cons consumption? And does that present a conflict of interest for you as a seller of energy? I have a third one just, just here. Uh, hi, um, my name's Tim Hendry. I work for a local authority doing like, energy advice sort of stuff. Um, my question is, um, are sort of the bills that you send to your customers, are they, um, are they different in terms of how you present information to your customers compared to the big six? And with sort of the changing relationship with sort of my uh, customer to business and all these kind of different models, do you, do you see bills, the way that you present the information to customers being a key part of like that change, if that makes sense? Okay. Thank you. So communities first. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Um, in an intelligent way. In an intelligent way. <laughs> 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 Skip the first few thoughts that I had. But um, the challenge we've got in working with um, in, with communities in general is that um, quite often what's happened, is certainly in the generation energy generation side, um, we have seen a lot of potential projects, energy generation, especially wind, onshore wind, um, where a lot of people could benefit, you know, local community, or at least as a, as, an, as a country, we could benefit from a lot more onshore generation. And very vocal minorities can block a uh, planning process, let's say. Whereas most customers would be, most local residents would be very, either happy or they wouldn't mind. Now, what uh, typically the the um, vocal minority tends to win this because the uh, the quiet majority, let's say, they don't care enough to counteract the the vocal minority. So, what we think the the intelligent thing to do in community energy is to help keep all the benefits of the let's call it the energy economy in the community. So, for example, what we do with OVO energy, uh, sorry, community energy, OVO communities, is to quote a wholesale price. So that's the cost of wholesale electricity plus the network costs plus our cost to do the administration. And that's it. And we give that to the local partner and we say, you can create whatever kind of tariff you want. If you want to have a zero profit tariff, you're going to have a very low price. If you want to have a slightly higher uh, price, but take that money and recycle it into fuel poverty measures, you can do that. If you want to invest some of that money into f energy efficiency, you can do that. If you want to encourage uh, adoption of solar panels, we can help uh, do the uh, solar panel installation. We can balance the electricity. We can buy the electricity from you. We can sell it to your local residents. And you can take the money that you make from generating electricity to fund fuel poverty measures, energy efficiency measures, and so on. The economic stay in the local area. You need a local authority, local energy groups. So there are lots of local energy groups. Uh, I live in a village in the countryside, and there's a, an oil buying club with 20 people. And they get together, and they, buy, and they, they negotiate the price for everybody. So th it can be as simple as that. We start off with the bigger ones, so cities and towns. Um, but going back to the point about generation, if more of the benefits accrue to local people, if every time you looked out the window and you saw the wind turbine spinning, and you know you were earning part of the money that was being generated, all of a sudden, a lot more people become happy about that and engaged. And they become I engaged as part of the community. But it's where you, you, you say with the wind turbines, where you build a wind turbine, you say, we want to put this in your village. And by the way, we're taking all the money. It's pretty obvious that it's hard to get people engaged in that. So no, I think intelligent for me is, is saying, like, this is what we're doing. We're, we're taking a 3% profit. So on, on, on that uh, wholesale stack, we say our admin costs are 3%. Uh, but on top of that, you can do what you like. So you keep all the benefits in the local community. And it's much easier to get people to work together uh, on that basis. Now, I've lost the other two questions. What was that? So there's a question on, um, that was on behavior change and potential demand reduction, I guess, and, yeah. and issues of interest. Okay. You know, is that against your interest? Is that, have I yeah. characterized that? Right? So what I would say is that there is a limit to how many people are going to turn off the television when their favorite show is on because demand for electricity is high and... And, uh, and they get a message to say, would they mind turning off the power? Um, there are other applications, like refrigeration, for example, that are, that are not time sensitive. So modern fridges can run for hours without you know, any electricity. They would well, say they will run. They will stay cold for hours. Freezers will stay cold for hours without electricity. So there are devices where you can turn the power off, turn the power down. To, consume, to, to save energy at peak times. That's peak shaving or demand reduction. Um, when that can be made passive by the interconnectivity of uh, uh, connected devices to a home hub that's connected to the electricity market. So when we send a signal to uh, 100,000 meters in the country to say electricity prices are higher, uh, if you can dial down the demand, we'll be paying you money for saving energy at this point or reducing demand at this point. And, and those, there's no human interaction. It's a passive system. Then that's when that demand reduction can become really uh, uh, very easy for consumers to live with. Or, uh, you know, the, 
that they'll embrace that. Now, there's a product replacement life cycle, so you can get fridges now, you can get um, appliances now that will have this connectivity capability built in, but it's going to take time for that to become the norm. But that's peak share, uh, demand reduction uh, at, at peak times, so which is quite different from energy efficiency, I suppose, um, but an important factor. Um, for energy efficiency, I mean, I think it's in the 20s. It's a, the biggest um, percentage of, elect, uh, of energy that we use in the UK is for space heating. It's for heating homes, in other words. And so there's a huge amount that we can do to invest in our housing stock to make them more energy efficient. The single greatest, uh, I, I heard this a few months ago, and I always meant to confirm this, but I think it's true. The biggest impact that we've had in the UK on climate change has been a, man, a mandated requirement for all boilers to be condensing boilers. This is the, it's a technology, it's a very basic technology, gas boilers, the condensing gas boilers, much more efficient than the model that came before. And by simply saying that we're only uh, going to allow condensing boilers, the government have dramatically reduced gas consumption to a point where our average customer now is using, in the region, about 35 to 40 percent less than when we started in 2009. And that's just a product replacement cycle. So we replace old boilers with more efficient ones. We're using much less gas. And so coming back to the last part of your question, which is about our business model, we firmly believe that we need to make our business based on something that's sustainable. I don't just mean environmentally sustainable, although of course I do mean that, but economically sustainable. <coughs> and so we think of it like this. We think we have got the option to focus our business in any direction that we like. So what we do, we think about what is best for customers, and then we say, how can we make that profitable? So for us and our customers, what's best for customers is that they, they use slightly less energy, or at least they use it in better ways. They don't waste as much. So what's best for our customers is wasting less energy or using less. We have to make that profitable. So then we're in the business now of installing tens of thousands of smart meters. Uh, we're going to be helping customers with energy data analysis. We're going to be helping with smart thermostats and uh, smart devices. And we have to be in the business of partnering with customers to use less money, uh, sorry, use less energy, and both of us sharing in the benefits. If you own power stations, it's very difficult to make that business case because you still have the same number of kilowatt hours you've got to sell every day. This is where being an energy retailer, we think, is a much smarter way to be in the energy business. And there's a question here about bills, and I'm going to answer it in the broader context of customer communications. So we send out 400,000 bills a month, and to my embarrassment, you know, we started out, they were better than the rest. Uh, they're about the same now. You know, our other energy companies have seen what we've done. They've always been quite clear. The unfortunate thing from, off -gem, from our point of view, off-gem require us to list a whole bunch of complexity that customers have never asked about. Like, anybody know what calorific value is? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Would you like to explain? <laughs> no, it's <okay. laughs> So the calorific value is a measure of the amount of energy contained in a volume, any specific volume of, of gas. Calorific value determines how many kilowatt hours there are in a cubic meter of gas, for example. So we bill our customers in kilowatt hours, but we meter our customers in cubic meters. The calorific value changes day to day, depending on the temperature and the air pressure. Okay? The colder it is, and the denser, the more gas is in, uh, the more energy is in a cubic meter. This changes based on altitude. Okay? The higher the altitude of the place you're taking the gas out, the less energy there is in a cubic meter. So it changes by postcode, it changes by day. And we get a file in every, oh, dozens and dozens of files in every day with these caloric value coefficients that we need to convert uh, kilowatt hour, cubic meters into kilowatt hours. And that's pretty straightforward, actually. But then when you think that we bill our customers every month, but we don't get actual meter reads every month unless you've got a smart meter, in which case we get a meter read every three seconds. But we get a one meter read in a year, so we need to work out an estimate when you use the energy, how much energy you used each day, and apply a different calorific value to, to that daily amount. And then sometimes we'll send you a bill, and you'll say, oh, hold on a second, that looks too high, I'm gonna go and read my meter. And so you go and read your meter, you submit a meter reading to us, and then we have to recalculate all those days, how much energy you use on each day. And it might be that the price that we're charging, so we sell for tw 12 months at a time, and if the price th has changed from one contract to another, we need to go back and recalculate all of your bills, so all of the daily consumption for gas, work out each of the co coefficients that's applicable to you, 
and calculate how many kilowatt hours you used and then what the rate was and then stop uh, at the date the tariff changed and then go forward and do the same thing again on the new price. And you might not agree with that either. And so there's a lot of complexity behind all of this. So the, the bills are in their nature complex because we don't have actual meter readings. But smart metering is making this very easy. And what we're working on is where you don't need to get an energy bill. You will just see on your phone how much you've used. You'll be able to look at your phone and you'll be able to see it in real time. You'll be able to see when you go to work in the, uh, in the morning, you'll be able to see when you've left the heating on or the iron on, even worse. And it's just clocking up. And so it'll be a, con a continuous process rather than a quarterly snapshot. We're working on it. We're not quite there yet. Thank you. I'm just keeping an eye on the time, but I think we've got one chance we can squeeze, <laughs> squeeze in one more round. I know we'll have more, more hands and possibilities. I will do uh, one from each side and one in the middle, slightly randomly. So there's one here. I will take uh, you from here. And there's anybody uh, just, just here as well. So sorry to all those that couldn't get in, but uh, keep your questions relatively brief, and then we can fit the answers to all of them in. Hi there, Mark Linder, Quadrilla Resources. Um, wondering if you have an opinion on what's best for consumers in terms of the source of electricity, for example, offshore wind, do you have a point of view on that? Biomass, going into coal generators, uh, electricity from gas, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what's your outlook? Okay, that's a question about resources. I think there's a question, is it here? That's right. Hi, I'm cool. I'm Noah, um, I run an energy generation business. I was wondering, um, it's quite a short question, do you outsource your um, risk management and energy sourcing function in your business or do you have it in-house? Hi, um, I'm Isabel, I work in PR. I just had a question about switching times. You mentioned that um, obviously trust is quite a big issue um, with your customers and customers sort of with energy companies in general. Um, I know um, suppliers like SSE and First Utility have already cut their switching times. I just wondered if you had any plans to do so. Okay, so what's best for customers when it comes to source of electricity? Um, the best balance between energy security, cost, and environmental impact. Um, it's hard to say unless we know what the price of carbon is. I think, for me, that's the big issue. Um, I have a suspicion that the best mix we've got right now is a balance between the lowest cost forms of renewable, and, uh, and that's onshore wind, combined with the, the cheapest and cleanest form of fossil fuel-based energy, which is gas. There's a lot of natural gas in the world, loads of it. And uh, what, I, what I observe is that in Germany, where they spend all this money building all these renewable technologies at quite high prices, their CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour are going up. And they're going up because they're building more lignite power stations. Lignite is the dirtiest, cheapest form of coal. And they're building lignite power stations um, because the cost of the, uh, the, 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 the artificial subsidy that is being paid to solar and wind generators has driven down the cost of electricity so much that gas turbines aren't efficient. They don't make money burning gas, which is the cleanest form of fossil fuel-based energy. So they're burning coal and subsidizing solar, and it's costing $24 billion extra a year to pay for the solar subsidies. In the U.S., where they didn't sign up to the Kyoto Protocol, although there seems to be some interesting news out yesterday. Um, they didn't sign up to Kyoto. They said, oh, we just need cheap energy. Technology that led to um, hydraulic fracturing, that our friend from Quadrilla knows all about, um, has meant that gas has become very much cheaper, so it's displacing coal. And their CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour are going down. And they're shipping the coal to Europe. <laughs> and we are we, we're subsidizing renewables and buying the coal, which is crazy. All because there's this artificial subsidy regime and no true price for carbon. So if carbon is the enemy, if carbon is the thing that we're trying to stop, we should be pricing it and letting the market do the work. So that's it. I, I, I d we don't have a strong view. We think that Hinkley Point is a disaster, uh, <laughs> Hinkley Point C, which I forgot to mention. That is not thinking about it from the customer's end of the world. The customer does not care about uh, subsidizing uh, Hinkley Point. Anyway, right, uh, next. On outsourcing. No, we do it all ourselves, very important. Um, <laughs> and then and <laughs> PR. Switching, switching, switching times. Time, switching so, time, yeah. this is the thing I don't really understand because 
the switching process is, is basically a 13 or 14 stage process with bilateral and multilateral communication. So we receive data flows from other industry participants every hour of the day. And so we can't commit to, unilaterally, we can't commit to cutting switching times. I don't really understand the announcements from the other guys because if we, if we said that we can switch in, in a day, I mean we could switch a customer in a day, we could switch a customer on the same day if we call the other energy company, the network provider, the other company's meter reading company, the, other, the outgoing supplier's meter asset provider, which is the guy that paid for the meter. We need to send electronic communications to all of these uh, counterparties. And then we get re receipts back and confirmations back, and then we send another flow with the date that it's going to happen, and blah, blah, blah. It goes backwards and forwards. And it all happens automatically, but there's like three or four days allowed in each step of the process. And then there's a 14-day government-mandated cooling-off period. And so when you switch somebody, even on one day, they can change their minds and switch back for the next 14 days, but there is no process for switching them back. So you have to go into the system and basically delete all the files. It's called an erroneous transfer, and it's the bane of our lives. And you basically pretend that the switch didn't happen in the first place. And it's a mess. And so we'd love for switching to be a one-day affair. But this is something that it needs to be coordinated amongst all participants. All it takes is for the Ofgem to say the, uh, the, the, the SLA, the, the, the um, service level agreement on processing these flows is 30 minutes, not three days. And I if that becomes the case, six months notice, then all the energy companies have to upgrade their systems to handle that faster response time, and it can happen like that. So when I hear other energy companies say they've just cut their switching times, I don't know how they're doing it because you know, they're only one half of the equation. They, they're reliant on all the other parts of the energy sector to make that happen. And so if their counterpart on the other side doesn't, if they take four days at each stage of a three-stage three or four-stage process, then it's still going to take four weeks. Anyway, that's that. I'm thank out of time, <laughs> but it's been <laughs> a pleasure. You are out of time, because I know you have to be somewhere else, uh, unfortunately. But uh, thank you, Stephen, very much for a really stimulating talk, for answering the questions so directly. I mean, what stays with me is some of the things you've said about bringing lessons and business models from other sectors into the energy sector, which is something certainly I've been uh, keeping an eye on since privatization, but hasn't really happened in a big way until quite recently. So it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, please join me in thanking Stephen for, uh, for a great talk. <laughs>